Good morning, Four Corners. As we come together to celebrate God's faithfulness to us through Jesus Christ, and to all the moms who are with us this morning, <clears throat> happy Mother's Day to you. In light of the fifth commandment, which we recently looked at, Trey talked about a little earlier, I hope that today is a day in which you will be honored. But let me say this, uh, recognize that you will inevitably be honored imperfectly. Uh, so don't grow discouraged or disheartened if the honor fails to meet uh, the expectations. Uh, the Lord is good. He is our portion. He is our hope. And so I'll just say to you, even this morning as mother, if you feel neglected or you feel as though you have not been honored, know that, that you can just entrust that to the Lord and, and you can... Know that he is with you, his providence is good, his care for you is good, and he is your hope. And, and none of your children, none of your grandchildren will ever be able to honor you uh, perfectly, love you uh, perfectly, but the Lord does love us perfectly. But I pray today that it will be a good day for all of you moms. And as you think about carrying out the role of mother... With all of its difficulties, and I think I've said this before, but I passingly heard, so uh, this is not a quote, could, could be wrong, but I passingly heard someone refer to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones as saying that uh, the hardest job on the planet is the mother of children under five. Um, and ha having a, a two-year-old ourselves, I know uh, the challenge is there, and uh, some of you are very much, uh, some of you have several children below the age of five. Uh, so motherhood comes with many, many difficulties. But as you think about carrying out that role, I pray that in light of the Ten Commandments that your heart will be like that of the psalmist in Psalm 119.97. This is what it says. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And so as you're going through all of the difficulties and mundane of motherhood and, and even those who are, are, who are older, but uh, for you to consider that your strength and your joy and your motivation, your sustenance, uh, all of this comes from the Word of God. As you go through the difficulties and challenges, you're meditating on God's Word, you're drawing strength from God's Word, you're, you're saying to God with your heart, and with your meditation, that man shall not live, woman shall not live, by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he feeds us and he strengthens us for the tasks, for the difficult task of raising children. For the difficult task of, of overseeing a home on the practical level. God gives his grace and he does that through his word. He makes us fully equipped, ready for every good work as we meditate on his word and we grow up like trees planted by streams of water. So what better day, mom out there, what better day than today to think about committing yourself to being a woman who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, who focuses on the Christ-centered law of God, meditating day and night, drawing strength, drawing wisdom, drawing joy in the difficulties of motherhood. So we are continuing to work our way through the Ten Commandments, and today we come to the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment, so the title for the sermon this morning is The Eighth Commandment, No Stealing. So if you would go with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Exodus 20, 15. So far we've looked at Yahweh alone, no idolatry, honoring God's name, the Sabbath day, honoring parents, no murder and no adultery. That's what we've covered so far in the first seven commandments. And today we are in the eighth. And what we've noticed recently with the sixth and seventh commandments is that we are very much dealing with the heart and the act. So as we think about the commands of God, uh, they're not merely external. And that was the problem with the Pharisees is, uh, as Jesus told them, on the outside they looked really good. 
really cleaned up. They had all their ducks in a row, uh, T's crossed, I's dotted, but on the inside they were rot. They were internally decay. They were uh, like whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. The commands deal with the outside, yes, what we do matters. To not act on a sinful thought is a good thing, right? It would be foolish to say, well, I've thought it, I might as well do it. I've, I've meditated on it in my heart, I might as well carry it out in my life. That would be pure folly, that is to add sin to sin, What we do matters, but it also matters what goes on on the inside, what we do in the heart. And and make no mistake about it, what we do on the inside is, is a form of action. We actively think. We actively set our minds. We actively uh, allow our hearts to ruminate. We actively do both on the outside and on the inside. And so with these last two commandments, the sixth and the seventh commandment, we see that they concern very much not just the act, but also the heart. As Jesus explains in the Sermon on the Mount, we can murder without actually killing a person. We can commit adultery without ever having an affair. We can commit adultery without ever having a a physical, a a sexual physical encounter with another person. God sees the hatred and the lust of our hearts. He sees down to the deepest levels of our hearts. And that's another reason we need God's word is because it exposes, it cuts into the heart. It shows us what is in there. It's like a massive spotlight. Our hearts are deceptive and God's word comes along and it shines a spotlight into all these little areas of our hearts that we didn't see before. We didn't even know it was there. We see it and it's, it's black. It's dark. It's stained. It's worldly. And so by God's grace, through Christ, working through the Holy Spirit, God begins to purge us of that Sin. Well, as we think about the inner workings of the sixth and the seventh commandment, the same is true when it comes to stealing. And we see this connection made abundantly clear in the tenth commandment. I think that the eighth commandment and the tenth commandment are very closely connected. The tenth commandment is you shall not covet. We steal because we covet. Uh, Stealing, the act of stealing is an outworking of the inner act of coveting. So to covet is to steal with your heart, just as to lust is to commit adultery with your heart, or to be angry with your brother is to commit murder with your heart. Coveting and stealing are intertwined. And coveting is the seedbed for stealing. We want things that others have. We have all breathed that air. We've all felt that sting. We want, we desire things that others have, circumstances that others have, situations that others have, people that others have in their lives. We want them, and in some cases, subtly, Or maybe explicitly, overtly, we take them for our own. And by the way, we see this rearing its head in the youngest of children. Uh, The the original sin, the, the, the sin that is found in human beings from the very beginning can be seen in the youngest children. I think most explicitly, first I, I think with a, a desire to do their own thing and not to submit to their parents' authority. This is inbuilt. This is in their hearts. But also we see this very much in how children relate to one another when it comes to stuff. They see something, they take it. They see a toy, they see a crayon, they see some spaghetti, a fry, whatever it is. They see it and they take it. And they don't have to come uh, to much of an age at all before you see this playing out. They don't even have to be walking yet 
or crawling even before you see this playing out. It doesn't take long to show itself. And here's the problem. It stays with us as we age. In a sense, we are all like little toddlers. We're all like little toddlers looking across uh, at our neighbor's things, our neighbor's toys, across the table or across the playroom or across the playground. We see what they have and we want it for ourselves. Now, we're a little more socialized, a little more civilized, and so we don't tend to walk up and smack people and grab their stuff, although that does happen. We do it in more subtle ways, but we need to recognize that the sins that we see in our children are still very much in our own lives. They're still very much in our own hearts. And by the way, that helps us to be gracious with our children. It helps us to be patient because we're not looking at something that is detached from our own sinful hearts and lives. We're looking at a little picture of ourselves. And so for the, uh, as those who have received God's grace, we are those who are able to extend God's grace in firm discipline and instruction, but nonetheless with patience and gentleness and a tender heart. So if you would go ahead and stand with me, we're going to read our passage now. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 1 to 17 is the Ten Commandments. We, we're reading that each time, but our focus today will be on verse 15, on the Eighth Commandment. This is the Word of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am <coughs> Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me or in my presence. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or an idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son. Or your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And we will all have an opportunity today to honor our mothers in this unique way. Verse 13, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your Neighbors, You can go ahead and be seated. Let's go to our God in prayer. Let's ask for him to uh, demonstrate his faithfulness, to show his faithfulness to us in working in our hearts this morning as he promises to do, that, that he would use his word to equip us, to strengthen us, to give us wisdom and joy, that he would lift us up and convict us and purge sin from us, that this would not just be another time of coming to church and not just a, another time to gather, thinking about our plans for this afternoon, but that this would be a moment in which God does mighty work in each and every one of our hearts. So let's ask him to do that. Father, we know that you are powerful, and even more, Lord, you are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. You are the all 
mighty El Shaddai. You are the Lord of glory. God, we bow before you, we praise you, we worship you. We thank you, God, that you are not just sheer might, but you are might that comes to us in great love. Faithfulness, covenant keeping, steadfast love. You are merciful and gracious. You are kind and patient and gentle to sinners like us. Father, you have given us Apart from our own works, apart from any inclination of our sinful hearts, you have graciously chosen us and given us redemption through the blood of your Son. Father, we praise you that you have saved us by your grace. Lord, we ask that you would also, by your grace, this morning, this day, work in our hearts by means of your word. We pray that you would sanctify us, that you would use your word to lift us up, And to tear away the sin that so easily ensnares us. Father, we ask for your mercy. We ask for the scalpel of your spirit to do his work in our hearts. We thank you, Father, that you promised to do this among us. We thank you that your spirit is here with us. Christ, that you, yourself, our Lord and Savior, you are present with us as we gather this morning. We exalt you, Holy Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that... You are so merciful to sinners like us, and you gave all to save us. We pray that we would delight in you and serve you, and Lord, that we would listen this morning with attentive ears and hearts, because we want to honor you as our King. Lord, we give you thanks, and we thank you, Jesus, for what you suffered and what you bore on the cross. We pray all this in your name, amen. So as we think about this commandment against stealing, we are going to look at three things this morning. So these are going to be our three points. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. These are the three things that will occupy our attention this morning as we take in this commandment and zoom out from it. So first, God's ownership. Second, our stewardship. And then thirdly, Christ's lordship. So God's ownership, our stewardship, and Christ's Lordship. So first, God's ownership. This world is filled with nouns. It is filled with persons, places, and things. It is filled with objects. And the reason it is filled with things is because God created them. All the materials used to make all the stuff in our world were made by God. He is the creator. I can remember when our son Jacob was very little and he would ask me, uh, did God make that car? And so I had to explain to him, well, God didn't make that car, uh, but God made all the materials that were used to make that car. And, every, and he made the people who used those materials to make that car. And the tools that were used To make that car. Everything traced back to God's creation. He is the creator. Everything we see, taste, touch, smell, and hear from God. In Genesis chapter 1 we read how he carefully and systematically in an organized way created and formed the world to be a habitation for human beings. Those made in his image. And you're meant to to feel the weight of a climax by the time you get to the end of chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, when the Lord says, let us make man in our own image. You're meant to see that all along from from let there be light, from God made the heavens and the earth, from, from the very beginning, God has been creating and preparing and forming a world into which he will place his prized creature. The human beings made in his image. We, his image bearers, are to take dominion over the earth. We are rulers over the animals and God's representatives on the earth. This is what it means to be human. God has put us here for this purpose. But of course, the fall happened. We recognize that uh, what God had set in place in Genesis 1 and 2. We see the unraveling, the marring of that in Genesis 3 with the fall as Satan tempts Eve and then Adam does what his wife says instead of listening to the voice of the Lord. The fall occurs. 
And now we on the other side of the fall are carrying out this dominion and representative work as fallen sinners in a fallen world. So it is still the case that human beings are to uh, procreate and fill the earth. It is still the case that Human beings are representatives of the Lord, that we are taking dominion. But now we are doing that as sinners in a broken, fallen world. But here's what I want you to see at this point, most fundamentally. As creator, God is also the owner. So back to our point, God's ownership. As creator, God is also the owner. Yes, He has given dominion to human beings. Yes, he has established us to rule over the earth. But it all still belongs to him. God is the creator. And so therefore, he is the owner. And so we read this in Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. The earth itself, the imagery that comes to my mind is the shell and all the shells and all the meaty substance in between. All of it belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There is nothing in this world that does not belong to To God. Nothing. Nothing that exists that God cannot lay claim to. Everything is His. And as we come to the eighth commandment, we recognize that God is not just the creator and the owner, though we have to firmly put that in place. We also recognize that God is the distributor. He created it all, he owns it all, and he's the one who distributes it all. God gives, he allots, he distributes according to his will. He does this according to his wisdom and his mysterious providence. And there are ways that that we don't understand, We, we just don't understand God's ways. His thoughts, his ways are beyond us. And we don't know why one person or or one nation has this and and another lacks it. We we don't understand these things. We We don't know that we know that sin results in some going without and others being filled and filled and filled and filled to endless luxury and pleasure. But what we recognize is that God's mysterious providence is very much at work. He is the creator, he is the owner, and he is the wise distributor. And so we read in James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Lord, from the Father of lights, as he goes on to say, every gift from him. Everything we have, therefore, is to be regarded as a gift received from the Lord. John chapter 3, verse 27, there we read John the Baptist saying this, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. It's not a single thread of clothing that any of us owns that is not from the Lord with intentionality. And that changes the way we think about all of our stuff. It changes the way we think about all of our experiences, about every dollar and even every penny that we own, every relationship that we have, everything. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. And this is the reason why we pray to heaven, to God, give us this day our daily bread. We do not merely pray into the air, but we pray to the God who is the creator, who is the owner, and who is the distributor of all things. We pray to him, God, help me. God, provide for me. Great is your faithfulness. Give me this day. Give us this day our daily bread, as it says in Matthew 6, verse 11. So before we get any further, here's what we need to first understand. 
when it comes to the Eighth Commandment. Here's what we need to firmly get in place. When we steal, so we got to have all this theological backing to understand what's going on here. When we steal, we deny these realities. Okay, so it's not just I took something that's not mine, that was sin. All that is true, but there are deeper things going on when we steal. When we steal, we deny these realities. We deny and reject the truths that God is the creator, owner, and especially that God himself is the distributor. To steal is to take for yourself what God has given to another. God did not distribute that thing to you, or you would have that thing. God distributed that thing. He gave that thing to another. To steal is to take for yourself the property of another. And we do find in Scripture that it affirms the idea of property. Uh, This is an idea that that is basic to human beings. We see it with Abraham in Genesis as we walk through that, that Abraham had uh, these possessions. And we see that Abraham's possessions and Lot's possessions come into conflict. We see that in Genesis 13. We also see Abraham going to great lengths to try to buy this cave at Machpelah, so that he can bury his dead. And he wants to give the the amount of money, the right amount of money, with the assumption that by doing that, this will become his purchased property. No one can take his cave and the trees near it and the land that it's on. No one can take that from him. That's his personal property. And we see throughout Scripture that Property is affirmed, private property. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 to 37 says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field, listen to the language, that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then just a few verses later in Acts chapter 5, verses Verse 4, we get the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And, and they, they, they sell their land, they go to bring it, and, and, but they lie. They lie to the Holy Spirit. And we see what God does with them. But this is the point I want to draw your attention to in verse 4. It says this, the apostles say to them, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? It was your land. It was your land to do with as you please. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? It was yours to do with as you please. The Bible affirms property, private property. Dwayne Garrett defines stealing. One commentator of Exodus defines stealing in this way. Any method of taking the property of another person without that person's freely given consent, be it by clandestine theft, armed robbery, fraud, or embezzlement. And and we could steal a person's time. We can steal a person's money. Any kind of resource that that person has, we can do it slowly and secretly. We can do it obviously and outwardly. We can do it in all kinds of ways where we justify it. But it is all, nonetheless, stealing. It is all contrary to the will of God, contrary to the Eighth Commandment. Martin Luther, in his large catechism, says this, A person steals not only when he robs a man's strong box or his pocket, you have to put this, of course, in 16th century, but also when he takes advantage of his neighbor at the market, in the grocery shop, butcher stall, wine and beer seller, workshop, and in short, wherever business is transacted and money is exchanged for goods or labor. You who own companies, you who carry out work for people, to not do the kind of work that you're getting paid to do is to steal, to not give the quality of building, the quality of joining, and so forth. I think about this with our house. It's amazing. In a house, how many things you realize after the fact. You're like, what in the world were they doing there? You're thinking to yourself, when that guy showed up, did, did, he, did he not even put any glue on that? 
Like, what is going on with these screws? What, what, what's the situation? Well, why is this crooked? All the things that you begin to notice. We've lived in our house for about eight years, and you, you just sort of notice things as things go wrong. And it's just, I was talking with someone about this recently. It's just a reminder that to not do work well, to not do it with precision and care, and to take the extra time, even if it means a little less profit, but to do it right for the good of another rather than to steal away the value while still getting paid. All of these things are a form of stealing. So we see God's ownership. Now secondly, let's come to our stewardship. And we've touched on this a little already. Our stewardship. So we have two basic truths in mind at this point. Two basic truths. On the one hand, God is the owner and distributor. And on the other hand, we receive and come to own things as property. So both of these things are true. God owns everything, and yet God gives us things to own as property. The owner gives us things to own. Both of these things are true. And so they both have to be held up and they both have to be understood and put together. And you can't understand stealing until you understand both of these truths. God owns it all and God gives and we own. At the heart of the commandment not to steal is this great truth of stewardship. And you've heard this word before probably and maybe it's not one that you really understand, we are stewards of what God has entrusted to us. We are custodians of his property. Let me say that again. Any, anything we own, anything at all that we have that we would call my property, we are actually, even of the smallest things, a, a chair, a, a plate, a coffee cup, now, I understand that this could go on to absurdity, and of course, we're not meant to be hyper-conscientious about, about everything in the same way, but we are meant to understand that, that everything we have that we call mine ultimately is a matter of stewardship because God says it is mine with a capital M-I-N-E. We are custodians of his property. And what I want to do as we think about this stewardship is I want to come at this from three angles. So here they are, contentment, work, and care. As we think about our stewardship, I want to look at it from these three angles, contentment, work, and care. And this will also help us to get at the heart of what it means to follow God's commandment, to follow God's will in not stealing. So first, contentment. To steal is to fail to be content with what God has given. No one who steals something from another person is content in that moment. We steal because we are not content with what God has distributed to us. God failed. He hasn't done his job of providing for me. He hasn't done his job of doing what I need for him to do, so therefore I'm going to take matters into my own hands and steal. And that's what we're saying when we steal. At the heart of stealing is unholy ingratitude towards God. It is a failure to give God thanks. It is a lack of thanks to God for what he has provided, what he has given us to sustain ourselves with and to enjoy. You know, we obviously think about stealing as not loving our neighbor. And you might think, well, okay, so I'm not supposed to steal because I'm not loving my neighbor. That's obvious. I get that. And then I'm obviously not loving God because I'm not loving my neighbor. But it, there's more depth to it than that. By stealing, it's not just that we're failing to love our neighbor by taking something that is theirs. It's also that we are robbing God of the gratitude that is owed to him, that he deserves. The gratitude that he deserves as the giver as the one who takes care of us and provides for us and gives us all that we have. We fail to give him thanks, and in doing so, we fail to love God. He gives us our daily bread, and as 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, he richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Every little ounce of enjoyment, every taste of, of, of good food, 
Every, every time you lay down in your bed or you sit on your favorite chair or you pick up a book or you go outside and you enjoy your yard or you plant a flower or you look into the eyes of your child, everything is from him to provide for us, to sustain us, and also for our enjoyment unto his glory. God is glorified when we enjoy the things he's given with contentment in our hearts. Satan's great ambition is to stir up in our hearts this restlessness, uneasiness, lack of peace, lack of satisfaction, because we're just not happy with what we have. That's the work of the devil, stirring up our sinful flesh toward ingratitude towards God. Listen to how Paul describes contentment in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to pursue something in life? All that energy and effort that you're putting towards your material well-being, all that energy and effort that you're putting towards whatever it is you're pining after, craving after, whatever. How about putting energy towards this? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. I've seen all three of my children born and not a single one of them brought anything into the world except their little naked selves. That's it. They had absolutely nothing. And that was the case with each of us. And we cannot take anything out of the world. When we die, it's over. All the stuff you piled up, who cares? But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. It's amazing how numb we are to truth in this country. We have so much more than food and clothing, and we are so restless and discontent. How sad and how sinful. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The desire for more, the desire for riches, leads in one place, destruction, ruin. Ruin of our hearts, ruin of our families, ruin of what we have, ruin of our reputation, ruin, ruin of our legacy, ruin of our fruitfulness for God in his kingdom. Crash and burn. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is like a cancer, a blazing fire. It is through this craving. And that is what it is. It's a craving like Esau with the soup. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Who, who wants a lot of pangs? I'm not... I'm not signing up for that. None of us wants that. But we bring all that into our lives. We open up the door and bring all sorts of junk into our lives when we are in love with money. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I want you to notice this. A lack of contentment and a love of money can lead to apostasy. Do you see, do you see it? Do you see what it says here? It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is a flashing sign away from Christianity. This is a flashing sign toward hell, away from glory toward hell, wandering away from the faith. Love of money leads us into hell. That's what Paul's saying. We steal because we are unhappy with what God has given us. So we push him aside and take matters into our own hands. Will he not care for us? Is righteousness not more to be had than all the things of this world? Will God not show himself faithful as he has all these times? Then why do we steal? Little ways. Big ways. Quiet ways, 
loud ways? Why do we steal? So first, contentment. A second angle we need to come at this from is the angle of work. God has ordained a way that we come to have things in this world. He's ordained a means. He has ordained in his creation a means of us having what we need. Of us having things to enjoy. And this means is work. Work, labor, toil. We are to eat our bread by the sweat of our face. As Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 says, Before the fall, man did not toil. After the fall, that's how we eat. By the sweat of our face. That, that might mean literal sweat, working out uh, in a field in the middle of the summer, especially a Georgia summer. Or it might mean simply having to deal with the difficulties of our work life. Having to deal with all the ways that it just doesn't work. Things just don't go smoothly. It's frustrating. And, and oftentimes there's a lot of output. There's a lot of input for very little output or whatever. All the frustrations associated with our work. We are to eat our bread by the sweat of our face. Christians don't get exempted from that. It's like you, get, you got saved and, and now you just easy sail, easy smooth sailing. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. It's still sweat in the face. We're still in a fallen world. The new age has broken in, but the consummation has yet to come. God's means is work. And let me say this to us. There is no shortcut to work. There's no shortcut. I remember in my early 20s, there were all these little, like, get-rich-quick things. You know, when you're going off to college, you're sort of exploring, you know, the, the future is so big and broad and wide. And you, and you just think, man, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And so I remember there was this one particular scheme thing, and everything was, was legal, uh, legitimate, but it was just, it was silly, and it was just this way. I remember going and hearing some speakers on that. You know, there really is no shortcut to work. Yes, we can work smarter rather than harder. We can be more efficient. We can be more efficient so that we free up time for other things. We may come by means. We may come to these things by means uh, apart from work, like, for example, inheritance or uh, gifts that people may give. Of course, these things are a reality. But this point remains true. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. We recognize God's means of sustaining our lives and God's means of sustaining all the things in life that we enjoy for his glory come by work. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. Solomon says this, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? This is, this is in your face kind of stuff. When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Uh, to not work is a recipe for poverty, whether that is for a person or a family or a community or a nation. To not Work is a recipe, we are told in God's word, it's a recipe for poverty. And here's something I want you to consider. It doesn't mean that all poverty comes from a lack of work. It doesn't mean that at all. We recognize all sorts of ways that people come, become impoverished. But we are meant to understand that to fail to work is to invite poverty. And here's something I want you to consider. When God's means, as we think about stealing... When God's means are replaced with our own means, that is when we are tempted to steal. God has already given us a means by which we will come to have the things we need and things that we 
would like to have and things that we enjoy for his glory. God has given us the means, but it's when we set aside God's means and begin to take up other means, that is when we are most tempted to steal. So let me say this. Instead of focusing on what others have, our hands should remain on the plow, the plow that God has given us, as we plow our own field. Just like we talked about last week uh, with adultery, we, we are to drink from our own cistern. When it comes to stealing and when it comes to contentment, when it comes to property, we are to plow what God has given us. There are many things God has given us to do. And as we watch the Lord provide from his hands by the work of our hands. How does God provide for us? By means of the work of our hands. This is God's means for meeting our needs. Third, we consider care. To steal is to sin against another person. It is to show a lack of care for another human being. We see this in Exodus chapter 22 in the laws regarding restitution. It's not just outright stealing that is talked about. It is also doing things that jeopardize a neighbor's property. And so there, for example, you, you got the, the instance of someone who sets a fire. And they have to make restitution because the fire has burned up someone's field. And so you recognize, okay, I need to make sure I don't set a fire. I need to make sure I don't burn down someone else's house with my campfire. I need to make sure that I'm not out here uh, doing these things in such a way that I'm going to jeopardize my neighbor's property. But another important aspect of, of care is found in our giving. You can't talk about stealing without talking about giving. You can't talk about stewardship without talking about giving. To give to others is the opposite of stealing. Let me say it this way. The ultimate force of the commandment is to give. As we think about what is the Lord calling us to in the eighth commandment, he's calling us to the things that we've just discussed. He's calling us to contentment, calling us to work, calling us uh, to not take the things of other people, as we see on the surface. But as we think about the ultimate force of this commandment, we are meant to go to the opposite of stealing. What is it that God's calling us to do? He's calling us to give. He's calling us to bless. He's calling us to enrich the lives of other people. If it is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts chapter 20, verse 35, then it is certainly better to give than to take. We see this emphasis on giving to meet the needs of others throughout Scripture. Let me just give you a few references for your heart's meditation. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. By the way, a cheerful giver is a grateful soul. A person who gives cheerfully is someone who gives out of gratitude, who gives out of contentment. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods, and see, by the way, we have a lot of the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Remember when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats? What's he say to the sheep? They gave to others. They helped other people, and in doing so, they were giving to Christ. What does he say to the goats? They didn't. They didn't. James chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. Uh, this is the equivalent of, I'm praying for you. That's great. Sure. Please do. God hears prayer and prayer is powerful and please do pray. But don't stop there. One of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. As we think about this faith, that James mentions here in this last reference, this newfound faith that we have in Christ, 
this faith working through love. It brings us to our final point as we close this morning, and that is Christ's lordship. So we've seen God's ownership, our stewardship of what God has given us as the owner, and then now finally Christ's lordship. Jesus is Lord. That was the earliest confession of the Christians, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we confess with, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As Christians, we recognize that God is not just our creator, but he is also our redeemer. And he has redeemed us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. We now belong to Christ. God the Father has redeemed us, body and soul. He has redeemed us through, by means of, in the Lord Jesus Christ, his incarnate Son. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. We are not our own, but we were bought with a price. We now belong to Christ. If you are a Christian, It doesn't just mean that you have a relationship with Christ. It means Christ owns you. You belong to Christ. Don't sentimentalize it. Don't strip it. It's not just you. You're connected to Christ. You're related to Christ. No, you belong to Christ. He ransomed you from your feudal way of life. He transferred you from that to life in him. Christ owns us. This is not Jesus is my homeboy kind of stuff. This is Jesus is Lord, God, King, Sovereign, Master, Judge. All that we do and all that we have is to be directed to our Lord Jesus as the sovereign ruler of our lives. Colossians 3.23, which you've heard me uh, quote many times, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And you could say this way, whatever you have, own it, possess it, use it, enjoy it, heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever we do, whatever we have, unto King Jesus Unto the Lord Jesus. This relinquishing of ourselves under the ownership and lordship of Christ could not be said better than Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And some of you probably have heard this verse many times, but Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a great life verse. That is a great verse to encapsulate what it is to be a Christian. So here's the point I want you to get. This Christ-purchased life, this life that cries out Jesus is Lord is a life that stores up treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. And seeks the things above where Christ is. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. This is not a life of clinging to this world and coveting stuff. It's just not this life. This is not the life that we entered into when we became Christians. We became those whose focus, whose gaze is on the life. Who cares what the people around us have? Who cares where they go? What matters is treasure in heaven. What matters is Christ seated above, storing up things there. This is not a life of clinging to the world. This life in Christ is radically opposed to every form of stealing. That's what I want you to see. I want you to have a a grander vision for the eighth commandment that just, ah, better not steal. So much more than that. And it has to do with the lordship of Christ and the glories of belonging to him and all that belongs to us in him and will one day come to full fruition. The whole earth is ours. The meek shall inherit the earth. Who are the meek? Those in Christ who is the meek one. The whole earth is ours. It's just a matter of time before we take possession of the whole 
thing in absolute beauty, glory, enjoyment, and perfection. It is simply not the pursuit of blood-bought heirs to steal. Taking for ourselves is simply not our priority. What we have, not our priority. It's just not what we're about as Christians. This culture is so toxic in that way. It tells us that it really does matter a lot what we have. And we compare ourselves to others and we covet. We love stuff. We love to be fulfilled. Let the word of God sit on our hearts. This is not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is self-denial. And it is looking to the life to come. We turn to God from idols. To serve the living and true God. To wait for his son from heaven. That's what it means to be a Christian. This new life in Christ, this new life in the Spirit, is what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. He says this, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This is the simple, quiet, pious life of a Christian. May this be said of us until we fall over that this is the life we live. This simple, quiet, self-giving, others-oriented, life-to-come focused, Christ-centered and submitting kind of life. As we trust the Lord day by day and await our future inheritance of unimaginable glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would arrest our hearts, that you would take hold of our hearts with the glory and majesty of the Christian life. Lord, we pray that the life of Christ and life in Christ by the Spirit would so intoxicate us, would so fascinate us, would so satisfy us that there is just no place for stealing, for coveting, for all the worldliness that so easily ensnares us. Lord, help us give our hearts to you and store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Lord, help us to anticipate the day of our death, which is coming for all of us. No matter how much we try to numb it, no matter how much we try to ignore it, no matter how much we try to sustain it, Lord, we're all going to die. And Lord, we pray that we would anticipate that hour and what will follow. Lord, help us to be faithful in this life with what you have given us to sustain us in our basic needs and also to enjoy unto you for your glory, but never with the idolatry and selfishness that so characterizes our world. Father, we pray for your mercy as we are those who do not steal. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll be serving communion this morning, let me go ahead and ask you to come forward.